So our next speaker is Matt Mockery and talking about CEO coaching, which I think is a very apt topic. He's, uh, him and his team are one of the most sought after coaching teams in the country. Uh, he is a cr creator of the Mokari coaching methodology and the author of The Great CEO Within. Uh, he is a former founder and CEO himself, so I think he brings a lot of pertinent experience to, the, to his methods. And he specializes in helping CEOs and companies transition from freewheeling startups to dominant enterprises. So with that, let me please welcome Matt Mockery. Thanks. Thank you very much. So one slight correction, there's no way you could know this. It's actually Moshari, but that's totally okay. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So uh, thank you everyone, thank you for being here. Um, the, uh, the question at hand is what can a CEO coach do for you? And a CEO coach is no different than any other kind of coach. You have a, a goal that you want to achieve. You have a coach in the, if you play tennis, you have a tennis coach. If you have a med meditate, you have a meditation coach. You want to become the best tennis player you can be. You want to become the best meditator you can be. In this case, you want to become the best CEO you can be. So a coach simply helps you identify exactly what each priority you have is toward that bigger goal, has you say what you're going to do toward that priority, and then holds you accountable to doing it. It's actually a very simplistic approach, and we're all going to do it here today because I want you to experience it. I don't want to tell you about it. I want you to see how it actually works. But the question is timing. So we can all use a coach at any moment in our life, but when do you actually need one? You need one when you're doing something that you've never done before, that you've never trained for before. And I posit that there are two phases of any company's life, two main phases. One is getting to product market fit, and during that phase, you're a founder. You are talking to potential customers, actual customers, understanding what their problems are, and trying to come up with solutions that you then put in front of those customers to see if they actually solve the problem that you've discovered. Don't really need much of a coach for that because you're doing that over and over and over. You've been practicing that your whole life. Then all of a sudden, your product succeeds. Then all of a sudden, customers buy it. Then all of a sudden, you have product market fit. Now all of a sudden, you've got to scale. You've got to scale quickly and you start hiring people and suddenly you've got 20, 30, 40, 50 people that you're managing and suddenly, you're a people manager. Suddenly, you're a CEO. You're no longer a founder. Now you're a CEO. Now you're doing something that you've never done before, that you've never trained for before. And by the way, you've got to start performing now. Otherwise, the whole company is going to crumble. And there, luckily, there is a method that's successful for managing people at scale. And we know it's successful because we see the companies that have done it. Any large, successful tech company has succeeded in implementing such a method. Amazon, Google, Apple, Netflix, the list goes on and on. We know that whole group. Unfortunately, they don't, outs they don't open source their methodology. They don't share with the world exactly. I mean, people write books on it, which are excellent, by the way, and I recommend reading all of those books. But there's not a step-by-step -step list of do this in this situation. Here's how you organize your meetings. Here's the software. They all have software, by the way, that allows them to do this. They don't open source it. And so a CEO coach is someone who helps you at that phase, who helps you understand and implement a method for managing all the people that you have in your company successfully. And again, just steals from all the things that Google, Apple, and, and Facebook have already figured out themselves. Uh, but let's go through an example. Let's have you do this right now so you can see one little piece. Um, when I coach someone, there are three components of a meeting that I have with them. One is we talk about priorities, as I shared before. We identify, in this, in this example I'm going to do with you, we're going to identify one of your priorities. Then we talk about, okay, what actions you're going to take toward that priority. The first one, let's write it down. And in our next meeting, I'm going to hold you accountable to having done that. That's a pretty simple step. And by the way, it takes about five minutes. And it is 90% of the value of the coaching. The next thing we do is go into, well, what problems did you encounter as you are trying to get towards your priority? OK, that's what people typically think of coaching as we help solve problems. But I assure you, that is maybe 10% of the value. And then finally, at least I do, I always ask for feedback. 
how could I do better? And I'll give feedback to you if you want it as well, but I've already been giving you feedback during the coaching session. And that allows us to create more connection. So you can now influence me. I can, you can now tell me, I'm mad, I'd like you to do this instead, and I will. Again, if it's within reason, and if I agree with it. And what I'm really doing is, I'm modeling for you what it means to be a good manager. Because you have, whether you have 10 people reporting to you or 10,000 people reporting to you, they theoretically perform better because you're their manager. But you don't report to anybody. You report to a board, but as we talked about, just Jackie shared with you earlier, your board doesn't know the day-to-day -day of what's going on with you. And frankly, it's very unlikely that you reveal to your board your deepest, darkest problems because you don't want to scare them. Because when the next round comes around, you want them to be enthusiastic about investing in your company because if you, your insiders don't invest, then outsiders, it's going to be very difficult to get them to want to invest. So you want to keep your board happy and excited and therefore your deepest, darkest problems you usually don't reveal. Now, that's by the way, I think that's a mistake. I think it's actually much more trust creating to actually reveal the deepest, darkest problems, but it's a, it's a difficult motion to get to. Whereas therefore, having a manager, you would share your deepest, darkest problems so that they can help you, help unblock you so you can achieve your goal. So when, if I were to coach you, I'd become your manager. And if after three meetings, you feel more empowered, more engaged, more successful, then you know, oh, this method that Matt uses, it actually works. And then you can use it with your directs, and it's all written out, it's all in a Google Doc, as she mentioned. So it's super easy for you to then use yourself. But let's go through the example right now. So first thing is, I'd like all of you to think of, what is a single, actually let's use the example of being here in the next two days. Let's use this very, tangible time here so we see the feedback loop. Uh, for the next two days, what single outcome would occur that would have you, and I've already asked a bunch of you this question um, last night, what would be the single outcome that would occur that would make you feel, I crushed it, I crushed these two days, I took advantage of them as well as I possibly could, what would happen? I would like each of you to think of that, and think wild. Don't think something tangible. Think something, wow, that, that would actually be magical if that occurred. I'll give everyone some time. And once you've, got, you've thought of it, I actually would like you to write it down. Does everyone have something they could write on or a, a phone they could take notes on or a, a laptop or a piece of paper and a pen? Has everyone got something? Okay, because this, this is real. We're really going to do this. So I'd like you all to write down what that magical outcome would be. It's an output. So once you've done, you're finished writing it down, if you could please raise your hand, and once most people's hands have raised, we'll, uh, we'll go on to the next level. Okay, people are starting to raise their hands. Let's see when the majority have. Starting to come up more and more. Okay, great. That feels like we're, we're at about halfway. Good. All right. Next, I'd like you to think about to achieve that goal. And you might think, how the heck can I achieve that? I have no idea. Well, I'd like you to think if it's meeting a person, connecting with a person, then obviously it would be finding that person and walking up and saying hello to them. If it's learning from one of the that's actually, the majority of you have probably, when I asked last night, most people said connecting with this person or that person or the other. And the simple answer for that is simply when that person shows up, if that person is already here, finding them and saying hello to them. And if that person is not yet here, when they arrive, walking up and saying hello to them. So I'd like you to write down, if that's the case for you, whatever the first step is you need to take towards achieving that goal, What's the action you need to do? This is not the output, this is your part of it. So if you say, I'd like to connect with Vinod, well, you can't force Vinod to connect with you. He's gotta be willing to engage. But what you can do is you can walk up to Vinod and say, hey, Vinod, I'd like to connect with you. That you can do. You have no idea what his response will be, but you can control your part. So I'm talking about now the part that you control, your input. So everyone, please write that down. And when you're done writing it down, please raise your hand. Great, people are starting to finish. Excellent, few more, almost there. 
Great. I think we're getting towards more than half. Okay. Now what I'd like you to do, and this is where the accountability comes in. If all that happens is you've written this down and I ask you to go do it, mm, you probably, you maybe do it, but maybe you don't. So now I'm going to ask you to turn to the person, sort of pair up here. So we'll have you two go and you two go and you two go and you may have to turn behind you. Everyone find a pair, find a person. And if it's end up being three people, that's fine. And I'd like you to turn to that other person and tell them the action that you are going to take towards this goal of making this conference as useful as it can possibly be. And that other person, and once you've done it, I want you later in this conference to find that person and tell the person you did it. That's it. So can you all please turn and find an accountability partner? Yep, I'm making this interactive. If you haven't done so yet, I'd now like you to switch and the second person start telling. About 10 more seconds. Okay, we're going to wrap that up now. Can everyone please say your, finish your last sentence and we'll come back to, back to quiet. Okay, coming back to finishing up, finishing up, coming back to quiet, finishing up. <laughs> I've let loose the hounds of war. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Pandora's box is open. All right, we're going to come back down to, to quiet, to the next phase. I'm going to ask you all to, excellent. Thank you very much. So that is, in a nutshell, what the basics of coaching are. It's simply an accountability partner that you reveal your biggest priority to, and they hold you accountable to actually doing it. And if you end up not doing it, They'll ask you, well, why didn't you do it? Did you, do you regret having not done it? And you'll go, yeah, I do. Well, why, why is that? What, what, what caused you? What blocked you? And be, oh, I forgot about it. Or, oh, I was afraid. Okay, well, let's work on that. How can you not forget about this in the future? Let's create a to-do list that you check every day. If you feel fear, why do you feel fear? Let's dig into that. Let's, let's do some kind of behavior therapy on you so we actually cause you to do the things you feel fear about and realize, oh, they're no big deal. Whatever it is, we'll get to the blockage and we'll unblock you there. But it's that simple. Once you get this process, you can teach it to your five-year-old and your five-year-old can become your coach. I, people share with me all the time, Matt, that's crazy. You know, you've got you this unique talent. No, I don't. I don't have any unique talent at all. All I do is I listen to you. Maybe I repeat back to you what you say so that you feel like, oh, Matt really gets me. And that opens your, your, your then willing to hear my thoughts for you. But if that's what I do, that's all that I do. And I promise you that all of you can do that too. We didn't practice that exercise. Maybe we should have. Maybe I should have had you each repeat back to the other what they said so they feel heard. Because that is a magical skill. And uh, you can only really experience it once you know it. But I don't think there's quite time to do that now. I've, I've realized if we go in that, you guys will be talking for the next 20 minutes. So maybe what we'll do now is let's go into Q&A if anyone has any questions um, for me. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Once the second degree value, once the 
Uh, what's the second degree value? Once the basic stuff is you know, not being afraid and following through on your commitments, once that is realized and the, your, your trainee or uh, you know, the CEO gets better at that, how does this progress? What's the second degree? Oh, that is, it's the only degree. I, I mean, I, truthfully, after three meetings, we're done. It's, you don't need me anymore. I don't think, you, if you have a good coach, I don't think you need the coach anymore because everything after that is content and content is readily available. It's all been written, it's all in video, it's all been shared. Uh, now, if you continue to, usually what happens is after I coach someone three times, I share this with them, I say, you do not need me anymore. And they say, but Matt, I have this connection with you, I really, I enjoy our sessions so much, please, can we please keep going? And at that point, I've usually, you know, I've fallen in love with a the person, they become my good friend, so I want to keep going too, but for a very selfish reason, I just want to stay connected to them. So I say yes, usually, but it's not that we're creating more, but much more value together. 80, 90% of the value is in those first three meetings, understanding the structure. And I also then always have, I almost always have them hire a chief of staff before I start coaching them, so that there can be a person who sits in on our calls, can see what it is that I do, and then just copy it with them, uh, with the CEO on a weekly basis. Uh, because again, you don't need me. So I, I know you wanted a better answer than that, but that's the true answer. Any other questions? There's someone in the back there or someone, oh, gotcha, there's two here. Let's go the one further towards the aisle and then we'll go to the middle after that. Other than not following through, what's the biggest failure mode you see when you're coaching? Mm, yeah, the biggest failure mode is the first meeting. There's always something, this thing that comes up, the issue that comes up. I always tell, ask the person, share with me the thing that you're embarrassed to tell me about. You feel so much shame around it, you don't even want me to know. And eventually they share something, and it's almost always at the base of it is fear. And one of the most common things I hear is, I've got this exec team, there's this one exec team member who's just not performing, but they perform this critical role, and, um, and, if I get, and, I, and I think feel like they're very sensitive to feedback, and if I tell them what I really think, and um, they're just gonna get hurt, and they're gonna rage quit, and if they rage quit, then I'm completely screwed, and so I don't know what to do, I'm stuck, so I just have to basically put up with it. And of course, listening to that, you can, one, you can probably empathize, you've probably been in that position before, but also hearing it, you can see, well, wait a second, that's kind of crazy. Like, how is this, this exec team member supposed to improve their performance if you're unwilling to tell them? And so it's fear of, fear is just the corollary of excitement. Fear is, I'm making a prediction about what will happen in the future. If I do this action, then my prediction is this thing over here will happen, and this thing over here is bad. Well, you can see that's the flip side of excitement, because imagine if you, you predict that you're going to do this thing and the outcome will be good, then you'd be excited to do it. And so, unfortunately, fear is a, is, comes from the amygdala, and the amygdala is, um, is much more powerful than the prefrontal cortex is where excitement uh, comes from. And so the amygdala can take over. But if you allow, the, if you recognize that and know that fear is more dominant than excitement until fear is sort of debunked, then you can, sit the, and, and by the way, the people who are not in your situation are not feeling fear. So if why had any one of you come up and describe a problem that you have and you were feeling fear about it, the rest of us would not be feeling fear. And so I did this with Tim Ferriss on his podcast. I coached him and he brought up something that he felt fear about. I don't know if any of you heard it, but I tried to show the audience how easy it is to identify where Tim is in fear. Like, I'm not in fear, you're not in fear listening to it, and it's so obvious what the answer is. And so what I do in the, that very first meeting is I'll make a bet with someone because I want them to see that their fear is actually giving them crazy thoughts. And so I'll ask them to make a prediction. If you do this thing, if you go tell, give feedback to this person, what do you think the outcome will, say, will be? And they say, oh, they'll get angry and defensive and it'll be just a really painful conversation. Okay, great. I posit the exact opposite will happen. I posit that when you give this person this feedback, and I'll, we'll do some role play so I can show you how to give feedback effectively, that they will say, wow, thank you so much for letting me know that. 
My goal is to succeed. I can only succeed if you tell me how, what it is that you're looking for. Now that you have, I really appreciate it, and I'm going to strive to do that. And so I make that bet with the, with the CEO. But, and, and, but the outcome is, the, the reward of the bet is, whoever wins the bet, then in the future, whenever we find the CEO in fear, whoever won the bet gets to say what the next action is. And the CEO says, okay, sure, that's easy. There's no money involved. Sure, I'll make that bet. I've made that bet hundreds of times. I have never lost. And it's not because I'm a magician. It's because I'm not in fear. And the CEO is. That's it. And that's why I say you can do this with a five-year-old, because they'll listen to what you're saying. They're not going to be in fear. They're going to be like, what are you talking about? That, you know, it's, it's obvious to everybody but you when you're in fear. I don't know if I answered what the original question was, but that was the answer I wanted to give. <laughs> yes. Um, hey, Matt, thank you so much for sharing frameworks like ACT to like really make sure we run effective one-on-ones. And, and my question as a CEO who's been practicing it for like rough six months is how do you coach the next levels? Like how do you transform mm -hmm. the managers into themselves coach to the, the reports and I guess like as the company grows, like how do you just spread this? Like not everyone can have a CEO coach. Um, yeah, what's your effective methods for that? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and there's no easy answer for it. And I remember Brian Armstrong and, and Steve Huffman both had that same question for me and, and they both, their answer was, Matt, can you please create software so I can just spread this through my company and not have to sit with each person one-on-one -on -one and teach them like you taught me. And my first answer was no, like, Brian, you have, you know, a thousand engineers that work for you and, and you're an engineer yourself and I'm not. Um, but eventually I said, okay, I'll try. And I've tried and we've gotten somewhere, but we haven't cracked the code yet. Um, the real answer is, um, practice. And um, in, if as I sit with you and do three one-on-ones and then you get the one-on-one -on -one structure, and then as I sit with your exec team and run your exec team meeting three times, and then the exec team gets the, and then you see the team meeting structure, having that play out in with your directs, then doing the one-on-ones with their directs and running their team meetings this way, and then so on and so forth down the line. That is the only way that I've seen it work. Now, there is dilution because what happens is there's a little bit of change each step along the way. So the most effective that I've seen is, again, this chief of staff or office of the CEO concept. And I probably should change the name from chief of staff to something else because we're starting to have problems with chief of staffs sort of believing that they're a C-level, uh, which they're not. They're really, they're the assistant to the CEO. So I should change that. Um, but when you have someone who, and for those of you who don't know, in the, the chief of staff concept, at least the way I envision it, is you take a smart human and you have them sit next to you, literally physically sit next to you for 10, 12 hours a day, like your entire workday for three to six months. And they see everything that you see, they hear everything that you hear, they have access to your emails, they have access to all the information that you have, all the inputs that you take in, and then they see your decisions, and they start to make correlations of basically about how you think. And then after three to six months, this smart human can start to do things on your behalf in almost the exact same way that you would do which is amazing because it, it does, it takes zero cost. You have to pay them a salary, but it takes, but that's not expensive. The expensive part is your time. So having one-on-ones with people and coaching them, that takes time. But having someone sit there and just shadow you, you don't spend any, you don't even have to talk to them if you don't want to. So it takes literally zero time. And then three to six months later, you have this almost perfect replica of yourself. And then you can deploy them into areas that you just physically don't have time to be because you can't be in two places at once. Now this, so I would say the chief of staff can then go help and coach and at the further layers. But that's another thing. If you do get this chief of staff, make sure if after three months it's working and you really like this person, oh, by the way, you have to really like the person because they're going to be sitting next to you for 12 hours a day. Oof. That's probably the number one criteria. Basically, almost anyone is smart enough to do a chief of staff job, but the key criteria is do you like them? Um, if after three months you find, oh my gosh, this person's amazing, immediately have them go hire a second person. Because what will happen is you'll start to deploy the first person, they'll start going doing work, 
All of a sudden, they're not with you anymore. All of a sudden, they're not helping you do your own individual tasks. All of a sudden, you'll miss them and go, oh my gosh, where are they? And you want to make sure that other person is, is already there. Uh, but that's the only answer I have for you. It's not a great answer, um, but that's the practical reality that we've discovered. Great question. I think that's it. We got 15 seconds left, which I don't think is time for another question. So thank you all very much. It was really great to meet all of you. All right, take care. <laughs>